these children, and we have some very, very low success, but not a very, very big success, so we must unite with different uh, neurosurgical um, uh, institutions uh, to make our best in this uh, position. So you see how improved the breath of this child, but uh, of course it's not, it's not uh, very good. Speaking about uh, trauma in uh, children uh, uh, elder than nine years old, it's absolutely the same as in adults. So we don't need special centers for children, special uh, centers for teenagers, because the trauma is absolutely the same. So we must use the approaches as in uh, adult surgery in these patients. And again, the problem is what to do with spinal cord injury, with breast problems, and with narrow modulation, narrow stimulation. It's the main problem. Uh, what is a big, really big problem is genetic syndromes and acute conditions, because a lot of institutions work with these children uh, in pediatrics or orthopedics, for example, Larsen syndrome, and this guy, he was operated in one institution with his feet surgery, but nobody understand that he had problem with neck kyphosis. And after small jump, absolutely tetraplegic. He became absolutely tetraplegic. That's why we need very, very good control of cervical spine, especially, in children with genetic syndromes. So I'll show you some more cases. You see this? Down syndrome and uh, tetraplegic after very, very small injury, after usual activity of every child. This one was fixed very quickly and with very good result, no, 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 not tetraplegic now. But this one, five years again, Down syndrome, tetraplegic after uh, falling down from the chair. This one with breathe problems tetraplegic after chiropractic manipulation. So everywhere we must check and make very good examination for children with genetic syndromes, with Down syndrome, to understand if they have problems in their cervical spine. Another very important question, speaking about children, do we need prophylactic surgery? For example, this guy, non-symptomatic, do we need surgery in non-symptomatic patients with this os on the tendon? To my mind, if it is active child, even with no neurological deficit and instability, we need prophylactic surgery to keep him safe all his life long and not to get any problems in adult life. So we are going to prophylactic mm, surgery. Uh, speaking about other genetic syndromes like mucopolysaccharidosis, it's very important to understand the surgical priority in this kind of patients. What to do first? To do extremities, to do spine, to do cervical spine, torical spine. To my mind, it's very important to understand what will be the priority. The priority for these children is safety, and safety is cervical spine. So first, do cervical spine, and then you can do every other region you want. Another case, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. Very, very usual disease for orthopedic surgeon when we try to elongate bones and to make restorations. But we must check the cervical spine to understand if everything is okay there, if it's not instability or stenosis, to fix the problem and then go to extremities again. So uh, we used this very simple pediatric cervical spine roadmap, which we introduced with Professor Ulrich uh, in 2008. So we try to determine the main syndrome, just not to go to ideological groups, but understand uh, the main syndrome. And what is uh, the, the most important? The most important is understand if instability is in this case. If you find instability, go and make surgery, no matter what is the age of a child. How to understand if it is stable or unstable? So this is unstable torticollis. If you realize that it's congenital abnormality, abnormality of cervical spine, and you can very easily improve the position of the head of a child, it's a very bad sign. 
is a sign of very, very great instability. So go and stabilize these children. So you see, it's congenital abnormality and unstable torticollis. So it's old case, so we used uh, hollow with uh, such kind of uh, uh, fixation. But it's uh, another case, you see little girl, two years old, with torticollis and positioning for compensation of her body. And it's very important not to go to orthopedic problems, not to go to scoliosis or a scapular position. It's very important to check why her head position are so bad. So it's again unstable torticollis, and it's hemi C1, very unstable condition, no dance at all. So we need to make stabilization first and then go to another surgery. Uh, continuing with the uh, cervical spine abnormalities, there are going some new, some, some new issues about this task. And uh, Professor Mushkin will, will uh, tell us more about this uh, pathology. And now we have about 15 cases of cervical thoracical spine inclinations. And uh, it's like uh, absolute uh, unstable and uh, st uh, unstable condition with big stenosis in cervical spine. It's uh, like a congenital dislocation of cervical spine, really. So uh, we made these uh, cases from anterior, posterior approach or combination of these approaches. And uh, Professor Mushkin will tell a lot. And I'll show you the very interesting case of very small child with uh, this dislocation. And this child was only three months when we found him. And uh, she has neurological deficit, uh, problems with her breathing, and with feeding. So what to do with such a small child when it's only three months old, how to make surgery? And you see that it's a big possibility of dislocation. And uh, anyway, it will be tetraplegic if she'll try to stand or sit. So at first, we made a cast. What was funny? that our anesthesiologist made anesthesia with a smart uh, smartphone, just uh, showing movies to her. So we made uh, this cast. And with this cast, she was stable enough for several months. But it's very hard to control a baby, a little baby, with, uh, uh, um, with uh, 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 this orthosis. So you see that she is now sitting, no neurological deficit. Then we go to posterior surgery at eight months of age. And this uh, construct was stable uh, for about eight months. After this, it was some uh, uh, problems and uh, dislocation because of very high level of growing, so very fast growing. So we put another construct from back, hollow. And then we go anteriorly make anterior decompression, stabilization, and now this child is about two years old and everything is okay, non-tetraplegic. Everything is under control. So speaking about stenosis, we can go from posteriorly, from anterior, high, like here, trans-oral uh, decompression and stabilization. And very rare condition, bow hunter stroke. We have two cases with children, with bow hunter stroke and vessel, co vessel compression when the child uh, tried to rotate his head. So we can make decompression and stabilization. And cervical congenital scoliosis, it's not uh, only cosmetic problem, but mostly cosmetic. So now we can easily resect hemivertebrates, especially if they are in cervical thoracic region, and make very, very good restoration of cervical spine. And if, in, if it is impossible, it's impossible to make restoration, if it is no neck at all, like in Lippel-Fell syndrome, we can make a little longer neck with toracal spine. So we can reject ribs and dislocate scapula to make neck more long. So cosmetic surgery in pediatric uh, orthopedics is possible too. And about real condition in C1, C2 rotational fixation, we can use HALAR in the first step if we have such a problem. But if it is a long-lasting situation, we have to do surgery. It's usually we use HAMS technique for these children. 
see, we, uh, you can restore the position of head, but you will anyway lost uh, the rotation in C1, C2. But if it is lost landing, lasting condition, you can get bone block, spontaneous bone block in C1, C2. So you need to go to uh, lower vertebra because it's impossible to cut this vertebra and to restore movements. It's impossible. So you can only go with uh, position of other vertebrae to improve the position of the head. So uh, we have red flags, and the red flags for pediatric cervical spine conditions are high energy trauma mechanism, neurological damage, neck deformity, face neck stigmata, multiply abnormalities, and genetic syndrome. So look very attentively to these children. And what is technical points are uh, it's very good planning, color is very important, and color and positioning and uh, control. So it's usually a lot of problems with positioning of these patients because uh, we have a lot of equipment around and the size of patients are usually very small. Neck is very short and you must have very good coordination with other team to work with these patients. And sometimes it's problem with usual hollow because you know that the scalp is not so strong and in some abnormalities or genetic syndromes, the quality of bone is not as usual. That's why we have about three complications of using HALA with usual devices. So now we use a lot of HALA like this. So when we, we can put more screws uh, to stabilize the position of head or even this with plaster. What's more, we widely use 3D printed templates in, uh, to position our screws because the size is very small and it's very hard to make very good navigation. So we need uh, 3D templates. You see this transpedicular fixation and two years old child. So it's very effective with 3D navigation. And in hyperkinetic forms, when we need very big strengths, and you know that the structures are very small and not so strong, we can use three rod constructs like here, you see three rod construct, just to get very, very strong position and to find the points for screws because you don't have a lot of points in such a small child and you need strong fixation. See how it's, it's possible only with a um, three rod system. So take, um, uh, take home messages are uh, that first of all, it's very dangerous conditions. So first of all, try to understand if you have a problem with such a child. And syndromatic patients are at great risk. And outcomes are better in high volume centers. And big, very good teams are very important, are very necessary. So welcome to Lizarov Center. We have our spine fellowship program. Uh, and uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, students coming from all over the world. So welcome, thank you very much. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, any questions? Anybody would like to ask some questions? Sorry? You know, because you face a patient without any symptoms active and to convince him to fix his head or to fix his uh, uh, C1, C2, it is not easy. Therefore, but really, do you have a literature, do you have a studied how much risk they have to have damaged or something like this? We, when you want to convince the patient to do this surgery, it's not easy when he has accidental finding. Okay, so it's a big problem with evidence in these, uh, in, with these patients because uh, there are not a lot of cases all over the world. But if we understand that some adults can have acute neurological deficit because of this condition, and when you see a lot of pediatric problems, when you see that after a good life, after some very, very small injury, uh, children will uh, get very, very bad tetraplegic conditions. You can show these cases to other staff, to, uh, to uh, people, to, to patients, to his uh, parents, to make him understand that they have a bomb inside the neck of the child. And if this bomb will explore, it will be, he will be tetraplegic or even dirt. That's why if you will speak in this way, you will find the opportunity to make surgery. But of course, you need some tests to understand if it is some movements in this place. And uh, 
if, if there are some instability on functional CT or functional X-ray even, you will go anyway and do surgery. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, undoubtedly the black belt of spinal surgery, which has multiple challenges, especially in, in uh, very small kids. Uh, and some of the challenges represent the particular anatomy. Another challenge is the uh, very small pedicles, for example, uh, uh, and finding the appropriate implant for the specific child. Uh, another challenge is the timing of surgery. And another challenge is the growing spine uh, would you like to comment anything on this, on the implants, bone fusion, growing spine? Yeah. So absolutely perfect comment because uh, it's all the problems which we have in pediatric, uh, not only cervical surgery, but in pediatric surgery and orthopedics, not only spine, really. It's growing, first of all. The, what is very good, that we have very short segments to fix. So my idea that we must fix only side where it is a problem. So don't go for long fixation in small children. To do this, you must have the technique of screw fixation because uh, uh, you can't do this with hooks. So go to locus. Don't make long fixation. If you will do this, child is usually have very good compensation for movement. So if you'll fix C1, C2 in adult, it will be very bad surgery. So try to avoid to do this in adult. But if you're going to C1 to C2, to C2 in children, uh, in one or two years, you will see that the child will obtain very good uh, range of motion as a usual human, no problem. But anyway, you must fix for very, very small side, only for abnormality uh, vertebra. And uh, speaking about the size of construct, no problem, really. It's, it's not a big problem because we realized that 3.5 usual screws for cervical spine are absolutely possible to use in pediatric uh, conditions, even for one year, two years, or see, eight years, uh, eight month uh, child. So it's possible. The problem with uh, plates, especially occiput plates, are very big. So it's a big problem to cover them. So we need more low profile for plates. It's another problem. And for anterior surgery, we use uh, plates uh, for uh, scalp, uh, for scalp uh, plastic, not uh, usual plates for adult surgery. This is the difference. But we are speaking about child one year, two years old. When we're speaking about three years, four years, five and further, no problem at all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Any other questions? So you think uh, you can you use adult systems for QGT? Absolutely. And this is okay. It's you good. don't need special pediatric? No. Interesting. Thank you. Low pro only low profile in some, in some, I, I, some I, I, special prof cases. Prof yeah. Profile of yeah. um, the roads, profile yeah. of the blades, but the screws, diameter of the screws, yeah. length is the same. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. There is one more question. I have one question. Uh, when you. What uh, vertebra in low uh, cervical spine from children you prefer to stop fixation uh, when you need occipital cervical fusion? Because I saw from a lot of patients when we stop at uh, C3, C4 uh, fixation, uh, I often uh, saw DJK, cathodic before. Uh, uh, in low level of surgery, what, 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 how, do you, uh, how do you decide this uh, problem? Mm -hmm. So, very good question. Uh, first of all, we have the main lordosis curvative in C0, C1, C2. So, it's a very important place. So, if we are going to spondylar disease and if we want to make C0, Cx, so going uh, uh, to, uh, to make uh, occipital spondylar disease. So we go, we try to do only C0, C1, C2, or C0, Otsiput, C2. And we try not to go further, because if you are going further, you just lock uh, more, uh, more uh, discs, more, more uh, vertebra, and you will have uh, these uh, problems of uh, junctional kyphotic deformity. So we try to make it very local, 
In a small child, it's possible. And do very good bone fusion. I usually take rib. I don't use artificial uh, bone because uh, ribs are very, very good quality of material. So, and make very good preparation on the side of uh, bone fusion. And then put the rib and fix the rib and put very, very small fixation. Usually, also put C2. No going further. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question about the timing of surgery. Uh, in congenital uh, abnormalities, uh, would you prefer to wait a bit longer until the child is growing, or you would prefer to do the surgery at the time of the diagnosis? If we are speaking about primary unstable uh, uh, problems, uh, primary unstable abnormalities, when it's absolutely unstable in the site of abnormality, also down to them, or some hemivertebra, unstable hemivertebra, uh, un unstable uh, C1, it's better to make it as fast as possible because uh, it's very dangerous. If it will become tetraplegic or have brisk problems, you, you will not uh, improve the situation. So you need to fix uh, the situation as quick as possible. The principle is so. So uh, in some cases, when you have uh, not such big instability or some deformity, you can wait. But I think that two, three years of age, it's good age to restore all the problems. And to my mind, you must do everything before child is going to school, especially in torticollis, because torticollis usually go to big deformity of face. And you have not only functional, not only neurological uh, problems, but you have a lot of cosmetic problems. Why we do scoliosis and cut ribs and make restoration to keep child cosmetically better. And if it is a deformity of uh, head, if it is torticollis, we must do the same. Child must go to school safe, first of all, and then with no cosmetic problem. Thank you very much, that's fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, we have to move. We have to move to the... Hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the next uh, keynote lecture on the neurophysiological aspects to motor control of lumbar cord and spine problems. Okay. Uh, is going to give this lecture Dr. Milan Dmitrievich from USA. Please. Good morning to everybody. It's so nice to see how many of you are still here on the last day. This is, is very exceptional. But you heard a very informative lecture which demonstrates how human neurosciences reach the orthopedic surgery, neurology, children neurology, and so on, developmental neurobiology. This has happened in the last 50 years. Neuro, developmental neurobiology of human was introduced slowly, as you can see here, and I'm going to try to promote your interest for the second invasion of your clinical practice by human neurosciences of motor control. And where is our problem? The most temporary gray anatomy textbook of anatomy, when it shows, when it comes up from the last addition is going to be at the best 70 to 25 years behind anatomical knowledge at that time. And this cycle of bringing new knowledge to the clinical practice in our curriculum of our schools of medicine is about 30 to 35 years. It takes so long to bring such meeting like this is a meeting which is trying to promote. This is what is not yet known in the textbooks. And I will try to bring you in these next 15 minutes to the 60 years of development of human neurosciences of motor control pertinent to your daily work. Okay, when, when I have, yes, uh, the lecture is organized in such a way that you have a short 
briefing of the topics I'm going to present. And then there are 15 of articles which are pertinent to you, which has been published in the 80s and not yet applied. But I am sure you have methodology now and it's the right time to apply. Now, when I went to school of medicine, I've been told that there is a corticospinal tract, there is an upper lower motor neuron, this is cerebellum, and so on. And I'd like to brief you <coughs> very, very quickly. What is happening now doesn't work. Uh, there we are standing. Something doesn't work. Can you help me, somebody? Or I don't know why it doesn't work. Is it a try? Okay. No, but where is beginning now? You, you advance. Okay. Here is a picture which I learned. I don't believe that many of you are still keeping this picture in your memories. And what has happened in the past 60 years that, no, I don't know how, I don't know, yes. What's happened, the, what we realized that we've been studying and depending very much from stage of execution of the movement, but actually, before then is a neural control of sequences, which we are going to uh, summarize here, is a setting. The brain needs to set things to happen before they happen. Then it's going to be plain as a neural control, and from this is going to happen to the last level of execution. So there are three stages before you are seeing, and this can be modified in many, many of congenital disorders, in many uh, other disorders as a trauma and so on. So what I'm trying to bring your attention, when you are seeing this, what you have seen in pediatric neurosurgery and so on, whatever deficit which are results and the same deficit can be a result of a very different underlying mechanism. And this is something which is making the sum of your interventions are less successful and more successful. So the lower motor neuron, the spinal motor cell, and innervation of confinal path is expression of an integral of many components and upper motor neuron paralysis is not only disconnection between this setting and the planning and execution, but it is the outcome of active process of control. Therefore, you are able to do what you have seen in developing neurobiology, and you will be able also to do in your adults to modify this expression from paralysis of upper motor neuron to the uh, actual beginning of the movement. Now the next picture is going to summarize one of clinical problems. It is there is no linear relation between deficit and function. And here you have two examples from a large series of studies of spinal cord injury of Professor Kukulas from Perth of Australia. He has 1,270 studies in the human spinal cord injury, acute as well as chronic. And what he's showing here, this one which you see as a Swiss cheese, is a patient who was walking, and the other one, which reminds you, is a very solid preservation of gray matter, white matter, it was a paralyzed. And if you uh, I'd like to tell you also that all this thing has been published. There is a series of many, many studies of recent achievements in historical neurology. And for instance, in this book from 1985, which was edited by late uh, Nobel laureate, Sir John Eccles, 
and myself is summarizing where we are standing today in human neurosciences supported with the results of experimental basic sciences. Okay. Let me briefly walk for the past 200 years. In 18, as you can read there, in 1847, the Spanner Court, for instance, is a, trying to introduce to your thinking that we are trying in human research to use advantage of pathology and use the same information which you're getting for your clinical treatment use for the models of these deficits. Can you stop talking, please, because I didn't talk during your... Can you stop talking, please? Sorry. Because is it... I, I didn't talk. Can you stop talking, please? No, don't do this. It's not nice to me. I'm lecturing, and I didn't talk during your lecture. Thank you. Anyhow, what I'm showing here on the first left, 1847, the spinal cord was recognized as a conducting center nervous system for the brain. And look at in 1908, Charles Sherrington happened. He said, oh, it's not only conducting system, it's also a reflex center. And then you have a very significant advancement in understanding of the spinal same spinal cord in human, which was from the beginning, now has been seen as a premotor and convergency center. Then it was next one, the same spinal cord is recognized as a pattern generator. And now recently, in from 2000, we introduced the knowledge about the spinal cord brain. Is it methodology for this? Yes. It is very simple. You can do this neurophysiologically, but after you learn all these things, you can do this as a clinician. But here is just to show to you that you introduced to your clinical examination motor task and motor act. They are well defined by neurocontrol even when you call chaotic spasticity, etc. It's not true. All motor output, regardless of the organization of neurocontrol, are well defined. It's very simple. This is so-called central EMG. You are using now recording motor unit potential as the output of the nervous system. The, probably the most important thing is here. If you look on this picture, what is at present in clinical human neurosciences, in human neurosciences, it is that you can introduce the principle of external control of integration with the residual motor control, which you can test it clinically as well as in your laboratory. The first picture on the left side is showing to you that the brain is generator of excitability of the spinal cord. If you disconnect this partially or completely clinically for volitional motor control, but not for posturing for other, you can integrate and you can mimic with your external stimulator, which is now popular for the control of pain. But it is a very, very powerful device to integrate and to study. And what I'm showing here, on the same level of the spinal cord, the same site, the same strength of the stimulus on the posterior roots, you can only by changing the frequency, you can create a phasic and tonic output. Do, does not with the brain, but the artificially made stimulator with this pattern of sustained repetitive stimulation, you can achieve development of the movement which you've been missing in spinal cord injury person. Let us move now after this short introduction to the lumbar lower trunk. And if you use the same technique, and you don't need to use only this technique, you can put your fingers to it. It is to recognizing that the deep muscle have 
two controls which you can examine, which can be very important for your treatment in application of intervention for the back pain. This is the paraspinal muscles, and they are under suprasegmental postural control, which you can, by just putting your fingers and turning your head, you can find out how well they are involved in many of your subjects before and after intervention, you find significant differences in their suprasegmental control, as well if you ask them to flex their legs, you're going to find how much you can modify the paraspinal motor outcome with the segmental lower limbs input. Anyhow, uh, you have in your uh, in your uh, handout, you have conclusion of this first paper, which was published in 1988, in the comparing the motor control of the subjects with the chronic back pain with the healthy population. And there is a particular pattern that in the healthy person, adult healthy person, if you expose them to the sudden load, they respond with the postural control differently, which you can recognize, and they, I do hope in the next meeting you will have much more information about this, because you do have between yourself neurologists who are trained in neuromonitoring, the same devices can be used for this. Anyhow, the other thing it is that these paraspinal muscles, they behave, interesting enough, like blinking reflex, they behave with two outputs if you're tapping with the monosynaptic and polysynaptic. Monosynaptic is only available that you have a reflex arc function anatomy. The polysynaptic is the one who is going to create your answers to the question before you do your intervention. The thing which we learned on this meeting, it was very often pain. And i like to bring to your attention that Pain is a good name, but today neurophysiology and your clinic recognize altered sensation, dysesthesias, which you sometimes you call and patient will call pain, and pain. There are two different since the, uh, the Patrick Paul introduced gate theory and all this knowledge which provoked after this work. Okay. Then uh, what I like to show here, you have a polymotor unit recording of a painful spasm in a spastic patient. And what I'm showing to you is this first picture on the left corner. And if you go to down, the same, you're putting now with the tendon tap, different afferent input. It shows to you how you can, this chaotic state of your first impression, you can change just by the input and, and processing of this, this is the basis of your spinal cord stimulation, which you have been presented also here. There is always a available for us a clinical assessment. And if you have discomfort or pain in the back pain present, you can do this kind of protocol to find out is underlying mechanism primary neurological is it primarily involved in the lower motor neuron or in the primary sensory neuron, or it is involved in the central mechanism, which is very different, it going to respond to you. This another thing, cognitive neurology today recognizes there are many, many fibromyalgia which are purely central and not as it was before. And all what you need, you give to the patient such, such picture, you ask him every day, to draw where it was a pain, where he described this. And then you try after a week, every day he will put this, and then when he comes to you, he comes with a series of independent assessment with himself, and you're going then to test him with the reduction of input and increasing in output, and you're going to find out what is dominant mechanism if it is not only one. All this, what I told you again, it is today we are converting 
the, your clinical assessment, which is mainly on the deficit of sensory and motor function, but they are integrals. They are not homogeneous. They are heterogeneous population. And you can draw for every of those subjects the mechanisms underlying, and you're going to find out that there are a large population of clinically complete spinal cord injury people who are not complete. They are complete for volitional motor control, but they are not complete for residual descending control for modification of level of excitability. And all these things have been published in many, many books, and they are going to come more and more from different parts of the world. And I shall finish this is what I've been asked, and I think I have done this in 40 minutes, if you check your play. <laughs> and I will finish the story of 60 minutes. It's a surrealistic today. And I'm ending this with a surrealistic illustration of a surrealistic artist from Vienna, which shows how all this dance is built on very different neural controls. And what we need to do, we need to jump to the hole here. And if you look here, there, we are working on stimulus response. Sometimes and we are moving from conditioning stimulus response to modification of underlying mechanism, but we must do repetitive simulation because the movement and sensation are behaviors. They are not stimulus response. You need to repeat things, including your scoliosis, including all this, what you're seeing. And all this story here, I will end and leave for after you read your articles. So you have these important articles from 1980 in your collection. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Any, any questions, any comments? Okay. Thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you for the interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, we have slight change of program. Uh, the third speaker is not around, and we'll move to the presentation about the efficacy of dress lesioning in managing pain following spinal cord injury. And we'll invite Milan Spaich to, to present his experience in this area. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear chairmen, my dear colleagues, I'm Dr. Milan Spajic and I'm going to report on you uh, what is, could be said uh, the symbol, the crossroad of the Yugoslav people tragedy of war. That is the chronic neuropathic pain of spinal cord and cauda equina injury origin. I would be glad to welcome Professor Dimitrievic, who arrived to us in the very beginning of Yugoslav people war tragedy in 1992 to offer help to us, but he is not present, unfortunately. <laughs> now let's go from the beginning. Uh, the Greek stoicism is recognized by their leader who said that the goal of one man is to achieve aponia, to be free, free, free from pain, and ataraxia, to be free from psychological suffering. We all know that all the people have to die, but the pain is more horrible master of the destiny than the death itself. Pain came from the word poena, the Latin term meaning the punishment. Pain therapy is to be to, co to consider it as the part of the human rise. There is a proposal about that. And this is the well-known Mesopotamian lioness in which there is an illustration of the spinal cord injury that led to the paralyzed legs, lower limbs. And this is a very specific photograph. Uh, 
radiograph of the spinal injury caused by the hand manufactured landmine. You see the consequence of the explosion. The further illustration is of the penetration, penetration of the bullet to the spinal canal. It was removed intraoperatively. However, it was said by Professor Neyshold that paraplegia due to spinal cord trauma is one of the most devastating injuries in human pathology. In our center, it was obvious during the period of the tragic civil war in former Yugoslavia. This is the pain drawing did by the patient himself. There is a great mystery during the century. There was a great mystery. How it is possible that someone feel the pain in otherwise paralyzed extremities? There is no sensation, but there is a pain, severe pain. However, it took the long time for this mechanism to be explained. Eventually, it was proved that dorsal horn neurons are responsible for the origin and pain mechanism. Thus, the anatomical structure, which is origin of the pain, is proved to be the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. This is the examination that discovered that there is a spinal epilepsy that is discharges, a spontaneous discharges from the dorsal horn caused by the injury and neuro neurobiological change inside the dorsal horn. As soon as this was recognized that the dorsal horn is the morphological side of existence of the pain mechanism, the new technique has been developed. The spinal epilepsy is being treated by using the special technique known as dorsal root entry zone lesion, the DRESS operation. That lesion could be complete or partial. We will not explore that. This is the result of the widely applied radio frequency lesion of the dorsal horn. And this is the photograph from the first, interestingly enough, first conference dedicated only to one operation. It was in Pamplona in Spain in 1997. This is the so-called radio frequency thermocoagulation. The result is this one, the coagulation of the dorsal horn. However, the main question in this topic is how to select patient for the dress operation, which is risky and tedious, as Professor Nashel said. And it could bring the success to relieve pain and disappointments. After six hours or four hours of operation, the pain is still present. Then arise the question of, question of patient selection. So in our program, it was the clinical evaluation, psychological testing, employing Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory, pain description, very important, crucial for us, using the McGill-Melzak pain questionnaire adopted for use in Serbian language, and neurological uh, uh, examination. There were several pain patterns, several pain expressions, with respect to the rhythm, the pain could be intermittent, paroxysmal, steady, fluctuating, and it could be on the territory, on level, below level, dermatoban, bilateral, border pain, etc. And importantly, the nature of pain, the patient could feel sensation of burning, boiling, which we term thermal pain, and sharp, incisive, constriction, mechanical pain. Let me show you some examples. This is the diffuse pain. The pain, burning pain under the level of injury. Comparing to this, at level pain, localized pain, the difference is very obvious. This is the bilateral localized pain. Thus, the main point of this presentation is is it possible to connect the pain pattern and the pain mechanism? We know that the pain perception 
is interactive transmission modulation system, interactive. That means that injury to the sensory system produce readaptation in the proximal parts of the sensory system, which are not injured. Uh, that process is known as process of diaphragmation. This is the illustration. After the traumatic loss of sensory input, there are the changes that led to the development of the thalamocortical transmission disturbance. The injury, the local change, hyperactivity of dorsal horn neurons, spinal epilepsy, and the proximal change, thalamocortical disturbance of transmission. In the Military Medical Academy in Belgrade, which was crossroad of the tragedy of Yugoslav people, the people were referred to us from all battlefields. We did the SEP investigation of the thalamocortical mechanism and uh, revealed that and confirmed that diffuse steady thermal pain, diffuse, has been originated from the thalamocortical transmission disturbance. So, the crucial slide is this one. The local pain mechanism on the spinal level produce local pain, a local pain distribution. Thalamocortical transmission produce the diffuse pain. What does it mean in practice? The selection of the patient is simple, seems to be simple. Diffuse territory of the pain, almost always burning one, such as this one, this is supraspinal mechanism that that pain could not be interrupted by the spinally based destructive procedure as dress surgery is. Dress surgery works on spinal level, not at thalamocortical level. So, the confined territory of the pain, as this uh, topography of pain showed, is segmentally related pain mechanism and is <coughs> an optimal indication for the dress surgery. So, the dress operation has been most efficient for the pain of confined territory and intermittent rhythm. Confined, intermittent, segmental pain, diffuse, permanent, thalamocortical origin. Uh, we were very, very happy and proud that Mark Sandu, who developed the surgery, the dress surgery, he was one of the founders of the dress surgery, said that authors from Military Medical Academy helped to codify indications of dress surgery in neuropathic pain, especially after spinal cord injury, after our paper was published in Acta Neurosurgical Vian in uh, 2002. Our results are localized intermittent pain goes to 80% success in complete relief of the pain. However, diffuse pain is uh, usually failed by dress surgery. What is the risk of the procedure? This is the motor pathway, very close to the dorsal horn. And this is an operative photograph. You see the scarring of the arachnoid, and this is the, the photograph after the dress surgery was done. This is the CT control of the dorsal horn, and the dress surgery, when it, it was done, the, this tiny hyper signal showing the dress lesion. The dress lesion is destructive surgery, the goal of which is to destroy the origin, the morphological site of the existence of the pain mechanism. Thus, it is important to know where is the pain mechanism. And what is our experience, unfortunately, that is that the most intensive pain originated from the conus and cauda equina injuries. Conus and cauda equina are, uh, were symbol for the very severe and intensive pain. Fortunately, the dead pain usually was intermittent and localized and could be treated very well. At the least, uh, at the last, I wish to say that this is the same presentation and it was presented in the Spine Congress in New Delhi last year 
which was very well organized and uh, well organized Pine Congress in New Delhi. At the very the end, let me remind you of the, my bone town with the old bridge in Mostar in the Herzegovina and note once again that as bridges connect the people and nations, said by Ivo Andrić, the Nobel laureate for literature, I can say that surgery, neurosurgery, serves as a bridge. Because of neurosurgery, we are connected here in this room. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a really interesting presentation and for keeping in time. Uh, we, we have time for one or two questions. Can I? Please, you have a microphone. <laughs> okay. So thank you for a perfect presentation. Dr. Spajic, you are a very good presenter. Um, I have one question. Uh, have you, uh, did you do MEPs during this dres dresotomy surgery? Any? MEPs, transcranial electrical stimulation and motor evoked potentials. Uh, well, the answer to your question is uh, this one. We did not have the radionics equipment. And we developed our own technique mm -hmm. based on the natural structure of the spinal cord. We measured the white matter and the gray matter and established that there is four time difference in dynamical viscosity. The gray matter was four time of lower dynamical viscosity that allows for the safe suctioning of the dorsal horn. That is to say, in our experiments, cadaver experiments, we confirmed that you can, under the visual control, open the cord, see the gray substance, and suck it using the sucker adopted from the needle puncture. And uh, there is no chance for this aspiration to injure the white matter. However, it is... So we do not use the somatosensory evoked potential because of technical reason. We do not have a neuromonitoring team. But our method was not technically based as laser, as radio frequency. Our method was biologically based and developed. Mm -hmm. So the structure of the cord was uh, safety for us. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, please invite me next time. I would really like to join your team and to do MEPs when yes, you Yes, I will be very happy to invite you in the next war. Because, <laughs> let, me show, let me show you something, which is a really original understanding. And I, will, I, I like to share this with you as my family, according to the Hippocrat, Hippocrates. In Yugoslavia, the dress surgery was almost not known the people were amazed with the injured coming, suffering from pain, and the, the legs were paralyzed. They were considered in the, the very beginning as a psychological patient, psychiatrists, until we understand that we are facing the new phenomenon in the massive number, which is neuropathic pain. In the small countries of 22 million people, the the neuropathic pain of spinal cord injury is sporadic one. In the United States, there is one center in Duke University, North Carolina. In, in France, it is Lyon, Marc Sandu. And in Yugoslavia, in the, this tragedy of war, we were the central and referral institution for the treatment of the pain. So in the next war, you will be invited. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I must go because I'm leaving in 12 o'clock. Can we ask one more question? Yeah, okay. There was one question. Uh, question. You still practice this in the time of the neurostimulators? This is first or second question. Uh, the, current, the recurrence rate after the, the heal for six, seven months, after that you have uh, newly pain. What's yeah. your right? We do have experience with neurostimulation, uh, and it works in the in the, this kind of pain, but it, is very, it was very expensive. So this, what I said, was the solution for us. We develop methods which do not cast, we uh, almost 
handmade the instrument for aspiration. I didn't include that slide. There is a film of the aspiration. You can suck the gray matter safely under the visual control. Thank you. The next speaker from uh, Croatia, evaluating management strategies and outcome measures for patients with a synovial cyst of the lumbar spine. Okay. Yes. No, no, no. We have uh, before you. We have one more. Uh, I would like to invite next speaker from St. Petersburg, Alexander Mushkin. He is going to present his uh, experience in non-traumatic cervical, uh, cervical thoracic surgical spinal pathology in children, which is another uh, difficult topic. Thank you very much. <laughs> the bridge is connected people. This room connected neurosurgeons and orthopedics. And uh, my presentation uh, have the aim to connect uh, the specialists who work with the pediatric patients and adult uh, patients. And I just ask to see you for this presentation as a continuous of Alexander presentation. Because for a longer, uh, longer time we uh, work with pediatric patients and maybe in uh, our country, this is the uh, biggest experience in uh, such pathology. It's not too much publication in the literature dedicated to uh, this uh, transitional zone concerning pediatric patients. Due to its unique anatomy, due to its uh, unique function and pathology, it's uh, not too much uh, publication, and as a rule, they dedicate it to uh, some uh, uh, topics for tumors only, for infections only, or for uh, congenital abnormalities. A few years ago, we described the pathology which Alexander showed you, uh, so-called cervical thoracic or thoracic cervical inclination, uh, and that uh, time we have a, a few patients uh, with uh, absolutely new for us uh, abnormality uh, when the part of uh, the spine involved into the spinal canal with severe compression of um, spinal cord. Uh, last two publications was dedicated to another part of uh, this pathology, congenital abnormalities with uh, atypical uh, surgery for uh, congenital sclerosis, and I just uh, said about this uh, some later. A few years ago, we tried to connect uh, the data of uh, surgeons uh, who has experience uh, in spinal surgery in pediatric patients with such pathology, and this is the uh, result of uh, this work, each, which uh, combined the data from uh, institutions which, which specialize on traumatology orthopedy, and two, uh, from uh, infectious diseases, and uh, you can see these uh, three uh, centers. Two of them are today the our spine reference centers. The material include 51 patients, aged from one year till 16 years with different, uh, uh, different pathology, including abnormalities, uh, neurofibromatosis, uh, spontaneous resorption of the bone, spinal tumors, uh, post-laminectomy kyphosis, and uh, infections as uh, specific as a non-specific infection. 51 patients. Uh, you can see this uh, data. Uh, the clinical manifestation, it was very interesting because no, no body of this patient has an um, uh, urgent situation. Uh, all this patient uh, has gradually uh, manifested symptoms and the majority of them has a deformity. As you understand, the deformity in pediatric patient could be uh, <sighs> describe uh, differently, and Alexander uh, described the situations when it could be very rapid, 
and when it could be unstable. But this instability uh, can lead to, 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 to other complications or can not lead to that. Uh, about half a patient has uh, the uh, pain uh, in uh, his uh, neck and not too much patients has the neurological complications, neurological signs. But if you can see uh, the connection between the etiology and neurological complications, uh, they will be absolutely another. A half a patient with a tumor have a se severe uh, paraparesis, but other, uh, the frequency of uh, neurological signs in uh, other pathology was uh, different and not uh, so significant than in tumors. The surgeon who began to operate this pathology, uh, uh, sorry, the pathology in this region, uh, have to be experienced in the different approaches, as anterior, uh, as posterior, and if you talk about anterior approaches, it have be as a transthoracal, transthoracic approach. The our patients was done in different uh, variants, different options, as one narcosis combined uh, surgery or from two and three narcosis. And it's uh, not so different uh, number of uh, patients uh, which was operated by these two options. As to concern the acute instability, we, has, we had this patient and in this situation the uh, holocaust uh, uh, corset, holocaust uh, fixation, could be the uh, very safely and very good options for urgent situation. Because during the main surgery, we can partially, uh, we can uh, remove one uh, road from this uh, apparat and to operate the patient in significantly better neurological situation without complete instability uh, of the spine. As to concern the congenital abnormalities, cervical thoracic kyphosis, as a rule, the result of spinal inclination. It's very uh, serious pathology, and I, I will not describe it uh, uh, very detailed, because uh, it, could be, uh, it could be interesting to know the ages of patient. It could be very difficult, dif different from three months till uh, uh, eight, ma uh, eight years, but it's interesting that this, uh, despite the very severe abnormality, one of these patients with complete compression of spinal cord has no neurological symptoms. The second is cervical thoracic sclerosis. This is the problem because when we talk about the surgical option for this uh, uh, scoliosis. It's not absolutely true what's the better, to operate it on the apex or to operate it on the sub-apical uh, uh, region. What's the better for great picture or for the great, uh, for the great results uh, of the patients? The sort is very difficult problem. This is a combined abnormalities. The situation when cervical thoracic pathology associated with the Sprengel diseases or with thoracic insufficiency syndrome. As you can see in this uh, slide, uh, one patient has anterior meningomyelia cell. Uh, the option for scoliosis, which associated with uh, uh, thoracic insufficiency syndrome and Sprengel syndrome, Today, our position uh, is if the deformity, if this pathology, complex of pathology, could be uh, uh, corrected during the one surgery, this is the best option. But unfortunately, this is young people, they grow, and we have to be ready that our very good initial result could be completely um, change during the, uh, during the uh, growth of the patient. Another uh, question for this pathology, for this uh, region congenital abnormalities is, in this situation, the such instrumentation is vector, 
could not be used because the upper part of uh, fixation is not the rib. It's on the cervical spine. This is two options uh, of uh, uh, combined surgery. In, uh, in first, uh, the zone of the fixation was long, and in the second, it was something shorter. In this situation, the long and short uh, fixation is a uh, very re re relative uh, definition. As to concern the tumors, uh, only four patients uh, was operated uh, on this uh, zone. All results uh, in this uh, patient was very good, but it was only initial result. Long time effect was not so good. Two patient uh, from uh, two from four, four patient uh, were died. And as to concern uh, the uh, infectious lesions, today the surgery, especially different technologies and different approaches. Uh, could lead to very good as cosmetic, as functional uh, results, and uh, results for, uh, for the growth. And you can see that so difficult deformity, so much abscesses, is not contraindications for very good, very beauty surgery. Uh, the another question is, what to do if the patient was operated on the uh, cervical thoracic region before and if we uh, react the complications, the after effects. This is my patient. Or, 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 this is a patient which was initially operated when he was uh, only five years old and was uh, one of the patients when we not only tried, we received the very good results um, anterior, of anterior fusion just uh, through the anterior uh, transthoracic approach. But a few, few years ago, uh, we can see the resorption of an anterior transplant, and this is a real position of patient. He can't to see, uh, he can't to form the horizontal view, and his mental questions, his uh, uh, life position significantly change. And uh, not only mental uh, dissatisfaction, uh, he has um, uh, not schizophrenia, but he has a serious psychological uh, question. What to do in this situation? Because the spinal is stable, the posterior fusion is uh, stable, and it's necessary to do the vertebrotomy on the fused uh, spine on the upper uh, on the cervical thoracic or upper thoracic uh, regions. And this option, the uh, reconstruction, not reconstruction, sorry, uh, uh, osteotomy on this region, uh, in this situation was absolutely uh, successful. The long time follow up for this surgery uh, have to put uh, the attention for the next uh, point. The neurological signs significantly improved in 10 from 11 patients who has uh, neurological complications before surgery. But in three patients, we has a uh, deterioration of uh, signs. Uh, two of them was transitional and was, uh, sorry, one of them was transitional, uh, but two was uh, severe uh, and they not uh, disappeared during a long period of uh, study. As to concerning the patient with spinal tumor, I, talk you, I said you uh, before that two of them uh, were died due to continuous uh, tumor growth. And uh, today, four patients uh, continue to, to be treated. When we begin uh, to prepare this work, it was very interesting uh, for us uh, what uh, the pathology could be a reason for spinal surgery in uh, cervical thoracic um, uh, abnormalities and other. It was very interesting that number of infectious uh, cases uh, prefer in this group. This is uh, the same uh, data that uh, you can see in the literature. The majority of patients who, uh, who was operated on cervical thoracic spine, this is a patient with complication of uh, tuberculosis uh, in this zone. The high rate of neurological uh, disorders, but it depends from the etiology. The key of successful treatment, 
uh, treatment is, of course, combination of different spinal technique and different approaches. Unique anatomical uh, localization. Uh, this is the one of the key for uh, better uh, results. And we, uh, we have to remember that sometimes the diagnostic, the complex diagnostic is very important to, to indicate what uh, kind of diseases uh, we have. And again, I want to say the color fixation in urgent situation could be very effective because it's not uh, always, um, uh, always we have a possibility to work in urgent situation. And these three questions continue uh, to be studied uh, in this uh, group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mushkin. Thank you for sharing your very rich experience in this domain uh, and perfect timing. Uh, any questions? We have time for one question, please. I think it was a very good presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, we have to move to the next speaker. Uh, surgery of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, mm -hmm. Onur Imam from Turkey. Dear colleagues, dear friends, thank you for inviting me to your country. I'd like to talk about the surgery for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Before starting my presentation, maybe we have to talk about the classification system uh, because it gives us a common language. And we know that according to the Lenke classification, we have six types and we have three lumbar modifiers and also sagittal modifiers. And there is a term structural or non-structural. Structural means if you have the bending films and if the uh, degree of the curve remains over than 25 degrees in the lateral bending, it's a structural and you have to fuse it. This is a case example. There are two curves in the, one of them is in the proximal toracal and the other is in the toracal lumbar part. If you have the bending films, you see the toracal curve is, remains over 25 degrees, so you have to fuse this, that part also. And the structural part at the T2 and T5 and T10 to L2, if it's the kyphosis is greater than 20 degree, you also fuse this part. And we have the lumbar modifier. You, pro you draw a line from the central sectoral vertical line and if the apex of the lumbar curve pedicles are, uh, if this line passes between the pedicles, it's type A. If this line pass over one pedicle here, it's type B. And if the line passes out of the pedicle, it's type C. And these are the types, type one, there is a a uh, major thoracic curve. In type two, there are two curves in the thoracic area. In type three, there are two curves, one in the thoracic area and the other one is in the lumbar area. In type four, you have three curves. In type five, you have a lumbar curve. And in type six, you have again two curves, but the lumbar curve is greater than the thoracic curve. These are the case examples. The main important thing in the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis surgery is you have to determine the fusion levels. In type one, the upper instrumented vertebra has to be T2, three or four, and the lowest instrumented vertebra has to be one level over the stable vertebra or one level over the neutral vertebra. This is a case example for uh, Lenke type two scoliosis. And in Lenke type two, again, the upper instrumented vertebra has to be, it will differ from T2 to T4. And the lowest instrumented vertebra has to be 
one level over the stable vertebra or one level over the neutral vertebra. This is an example for type 3. Again, the same rules. An example for Lenke type 4. Again, the same rules. If we come to type 5, there is a always, there is a rip hump at the lumbar area. The main uh, idea for the scoliosis surgery is not only correcting the curve of the uh, degree of the curve. You also solve the cosmetic problem here. And a case example for type 6, before and after the surgery. Another problem in adilosin idiopathic scoliosis surgery is the shoulder problem, shoulder balance problem. You have to balance the shoulder after the surgery. So determining the upper instrumented level is also important for shoulder balance after the surgery. Where do we have to stop for the balanced shoulder? We have to stop if the shoulders are balanced before the surgery. You may stop one or two level uh, above the end vertebra. Like in this case, the shoulders are balanced. So, sorry, if the left shoulder is uh, down, you have to go upper to the end, uh, end vertebra. In this case, the left shoulder is down, the end vertebra is T5, uh, but you have to stop at T3. If the left shoulder is elevated, the upper instrumented vertebra has to be T2. But, and there is no anatomical relationship with the spine and the shoulder. What's the correlation between the shoulders and between the spine? This animation shows us, shows us the effect of the co effect of correcting the spine. If you, sorry, if you correct the spine, let's say it's Lenke type one. If you correct the spine, if you bring the spine lateral to the medial part, the left shoulder is elevating. So you have to go to T2 and make a compression on the concave side, making a distraction on the convex side to balance the shoulders after the surgery. And where do we have to stop? Another uh, problem is that we have to make the lowest instrumented vertebra parallel to the floor after the surgery. And we have some maneuvers to correct the spine. The patient set is on the left side, the foot are on the right side. I'm on the concave side. We are starting from the concave side. We are bending the road according to the curve. Then, with the help of the instruments with Persuader, we put all the screws. I'm trying to derotate the road 90 degrees, and another doctor is pressing to the rip pump on the convex side, and he is trying to reduce the rip pump while he is uh, pushing the lateral, the convex side, down and to medial. Then, this is a, this was a uh, market course on Koch University in Istanbul. This is the translation technique. In this technique, you're bending the road according to the spine again. You're starting from the distal part and come to the proximal part very slowly. This technique is more complex than the derotation maneuver because during this uh, maneuver, while you're placing the, placing the rod to the screws, the screws may come out of the uh, spine. Segmental derotation maneuver is another maneuver and it's very effective because you see the rip pump of the patient here. If you want to correct the rip pump, you have to derotate all the uh, segmental uh, vertebras, each other. So this is the tools that we are using in the segmental derotation maneuver. 
you put the towers here then you connect sorry then you connect the towers with a bridge this is the convex side of the patient the left side is the concave side we have derotated the spine first with derotation maneuver this is the caudal part this is the cranial part you will see the effect of the derotation set now maybe 5 or 10 degrees of each vertebral derotation will give you very good results now we are closing we are tightening the caudal part now we are going to relax the head of the screws at the apex you see how can we reduce the rip pump in that part if you don't have these tools you may use the strong screw driver to do that and another maneuver is the cantilever maneuver in this case was a shawarman kyphosis you put the screws uh, at the bottom then you uh, hold the hold rod holders and push it down at the proximal part dear friends i'd like to invite you uh, to our meeting in istanbul this meeting will be a good meeting uh, famous names max ivy has his own classification and richard asaker will come there Dariano, chopin tarik imtiaz claudio la martina ovidio palea and Frank Schwab, as you know, Schwab, we know uh, he has classified an adult degenerative scoliosis classification. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellent presentation. Very good videos. Yeah. Any questions? Very good talk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And we have the final lecture of today. Uh, I would like to present uh, Mr. Imad Talama, uh, Dr. Imad Talama from Palestine, who is going to discuss, uh, to present a, a cheap and efficient lumbar fixation and fusion, which is uh, very important in nowadays to be efficient and cheap. Thank you. The last uh, <laughs> presentation today, thanks uh, for everybody here, that you are at the end and you are still here. Um, many thanks for Lucas and the Serbian Society of Neurosurgery because really they were generous with us and they uh, helped us to have a good uh, uh, congress. I am not uh, a teacher, I am not a scientist, I am just want to exchange with you some of my uh, feelings because I was working in Italy and uh, in a rich place and after that I went to Palestine. Uh, sometimes uh, in uh, the uh, poor countries, or uh, I was in Libya during the war and before the war. Before the war, everything is wa was present. With the war, the resources were ex exhausted, and I began thinking how to uh, solve the problem by patients, five uh, lumbar vertebrae fracture, and you have just uh, four screws or five screws uh, rest with you, and you must solve the problem. Uh, many times you, uh, you have uh, no tools, uh, like now I'm working in many hospitals in Palestine, in every hospital we have just a half working drill or half working C uh, arm and you must uh, make fusion uh, for five or six levels and uh, sometimes this C uh, arm work first, first uh, shot and after that stop. Therefore you must uh, prepare yourself to work in such um, conditions. Uh, really most of you have all the tools but uh, sometimes one of you think to go to Africa to help some people there and when he is in 
this in such situation he must use what is available to uh, help these people and uh, this is just suggesting to everybody of you how to solve these problems when it happen you must stay there and you must think about how you can solve these problems like when i was in italy if there's uh, no draping for the microscope we stop surgery we postponed it but when i was in libya I learned from egyptian doctor that you can use sterile gloves on the hands and you can move the and i'm using this for hundreds of craniotomes in palestine no fiction it is, it is normal, it is easy. Uh, sometimes you don't have um, uh, the silicon catheter for the external uh, drainage derivation. I'm using the suction tube uh, that costs $20 and the suction tube every five costs $1 or every 10. Uh, and it works, just put it good. You have, just you must be a good doctor to use it with a less traumatic way in the brain. And I have a good result in these uh, things. And uh, I didn't use in Palestine till now silicon uh, drainage for the subdural hematoma. I'm using uh, or uh, Foley catheter or something like this, and it is working. I hope to have uh, such materials, but uh, sometimes when you don't have, you must continue working. You must give solution to the patients, and you have many times. Uh, a problem with money. If, if, if your patient must pay the surgery and he doesn't have insurance uh, and he has just that amount of money and you must make him surgery with that amount of money. And uh, therefore, um, uh, I, the, most, uh, back to, the, the most surgeries that I'm doing is the lumbar surgeries because our people are fat, working hard, and uh, it is easy to have a lot of uh, spine fusions uh, every day. Um, I'm thinking, I, I, I was thinking how to help these people to have surgery without being uh, expensive. And in this, I want to just uh, to illuminate that we have uh, uh, always um, uh, in mind that it's important to fuse the segment, uh, the pathological segment uh, with the painful uh, manifestation during movement that uh, inhabilitate the patient to have a good life or to uh, work uh, hardly. Um, therefore, I, this lecture is about the bone substitute when you don't have uh, enough cages or you don't have money for the, or sometimes you, you have cages but it's not ad an adequate cages. Uh, therefore, we use the fusion for many pathologies that all of you know, uh, instability, that uh, make instability. Every uh, two, three years we have a new approach to the spine, uh, anterior, posterior, far lateral, uh, all of them mean to make fusion at the end and to give the patient the possibility to move without pain and to be functional, um, um, to have just, I uh, want to emphasize that when we uh, want to make fusion, it's important uh, that uh, the surgeon must choose the right way for the fusion, must prepare the field very good. Many people um, doesn't make um, strict attention to uh, clean the, in the plates of the vertebrae. Uh, you know, it is like uh, electricity. You want to conduct one vertebra to the other, another and you must put the spawn in uh, a good we, we have many bone substitutes, but uh, my um, lecture is about uh, the um, autologous pain. The autologous pain is important. Uh, why? Because it is cheap, and the patient has it. Uh, when in the in the past, when uh, we do the, the compulsive craniectomies, and we were uh, a fair from the frigor uh, to preserve it in somewhere, we preserve it in the patient himself. And I used this in Libya during the war. I did a lot of craniotomies, and uh, because these patients were uh, from Libya going outside, I don't, I don't send to them after that the, the bone and we don't have all of the electricity. The bone was taxed in the, in the abdominal wall and uh, um, therefore uh, we must prepare ourselves always to use uh, good construction to have um, the good um, uh, bone substitute uh, and uh, many of the countries in the world doesn't have bone bank. Many of the countries doesn't have the artificial bone substitutes. Uh, therefore, we must uh, know how to use the autologous pain in the perfect uh, way. Uh, and we know that uh, the autographs, um, we need to, to take the harvest it from either the, uh, the ribs or the, uh, the pelvic area. And this can be uh, painful somehow for patients, uh, nerve damage, uh, uh, myalgi and something. Uh, many of the experienced patient uh, people doesn't have this because they uh, improve their techniques uh, to uh, avoid uh, post-operative uh, uh, pain in the site of the uh, harvesting uh, bone. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the idea uh, coming from this case, this, is, this was the case that I have operated 
in Palestine uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, this case was a poor man. His salary was about $500. And I did this surgery with Medtronic. Um, this is the uh, X-ray control after five years. Uh, this surgery with this Medtronic uh, device. Uh, the coverage of visa securition was $10,000. At the end, the uh, bill of the company was about $16,000. And the hospital called me, come here, <laughs> what we can do? We must pay the, this, uh, these things. And I began thinking how to reduce the expenses from that time. In Italy, it was normal daily to make this surgery, bilateral cages, screwing, do what you want to do. It is covered by the, uh, the government and it is easy to have these things. I passed to do like this, just when I remove the disc, I make fusion with just one cage to reduce. But after that, in the market in Palestine, no one was using cages of my colleagues before me. I'm the first one to use this and not uh, easy to have cages available. And they are, they are so expensive, more because five times more than the Italy because they are, uh, if, if, if there are few ca companies and uh, because we, we don't use so much and the, the market need to be moved to have cheap things. Uh, I pass to, to this. I pass to use bone. Um, this is uh, a small stasis. After doing uh, a good uh, screwing with strong screws uh, and after uh, making distraction, I use to uh, put uh, bone and uh, to fill the bone very good between the two vertebra. This is uh, inside the, the theater. This is one of the last cases. Uh, but what I want to emphasize, I don't know if this is moving, yes, that uh, we, we must prepare the bone from the posterior vertebral arch. I don't uh, more go to take from the iliac crest, except for people who came to me for revision, uh, that they have good uh, wide laminectomies and la wide uh, facetectomies, and I don't have bone enough from the posterior arch uh, to, be, uh, to be taken. But in all my cases, when I have the, uh, enough uh, bone uh, from the posterior vertebral arch, I prepare it very well like this, if you see, uh, good uh, chips of uh, uh, bone for the patient. I put this uh, bone with uh, gentamicin, all this bone have uh, inside gentamicin. I put them inside a pure gentamicin, not diluted with, uh, with water. After that, I begin putting this. I did many cases since five years, and I have got uh, no uh, infection. Even this is the, the last patient of uh, four days back. I, uh, if you look here, two levels uh, full uh, of uh, I, the first surgery was done um, uh, many years back and with the cage. Uh, and uh, look, uh, th this, this was in the, in the site of surgery, in the, in the theater. When he came to me, she came to me, this lady, to remove uh, the stitches after 10 days, th we have got already the bone moved and begin to make uh, fusion. You, you see the um, stiplers here. Uh, therefore, I begin, I, I continue, this was one of the cases that you see, this is the last control, completely fused. This lady was fat lady and after uh, a car accident she came to me, I did this uh, for her and uh, this photo, the one in here, that it was good fused and no problem. Uh, this boy was uh, about uh, 135 kilograms. Uh, the, the, what I want to strength here that you must good, good screws uh, um, enough to hold the patient uh, for the first uh, three, four weeks, three, four months, uh, that to give the bone the chance to fuse. Uh, if you use, in these cases, I, I have a good revision for many cases, they use small screws, uh, not, uh, um, not good, the length wasn't sufficient, and uh, I want to stress this, if you can, um, uh, sometimes you have to operate ladies, old ladies, uh, and uh, in these cases, my strategy is to fuse uh, when you uh, bring out the disc if there is anterior compression, but the disc that you don't remove, uh, you can uh, avoid uh, fusion if you want to make a very quick surgery like such a surgery lady with the heart failure and the ejection fraction about uh, less than 30. Therefore, the, the anesthesiologist was stressing me to do quickly. Uh, this was the bone chips. Even in the old ladies, I found that it's functioning. This, her own bone, this, this lady more than 75 years old, uh, look, uh, the, this is the control after three months. It is, it is fused almost. Even she has osteoporosis and she's under treatment for more than 15 years old for osteoporosis. Uh, look, this was a case that uh, I, I operate without uh, putting uh, bone chips around the cages. 
if you look, there's a good fusion, but when you use more, more bone and you have uh, also bitter fusion, this fusion is not enough like the fusion that we see with, uh, when we put more bone. Therefore, even if we are using cages, if it's possible, we must put around the cages also bone taken from the patient. Uh, I have the same idea for the uh, cervical. You see this is a three-level cervical uh, surgery. If you look to the uh, cages, uh, uh, posterior to the cages, you see that uh, there's a a hole. I do good uh, decompression of the posterior uh, parts of the vertebra. I take the bone. I put this bone in the uh, in the vertebra. And if you see, it is this is bone. But this bone is taken from here to make it decompression. I don't need to go to uh, to, to take bone from other spaces. Uh, the one before his uh, control, and the, I use the same technique in him, and he's fused very well. We don't need to use bone substitutes or to take bone from the uh, iliac uh, crest. Uh, just uh, uh, we must clean very good the anti plates and we must put amount of bone that conduct the upper and the lower uh, anti plates uh, together. And thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Talama, for your very, I must say, very enthusiastic speech, a very enthusiastic lecture. Any questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, one of the purposes of the cage in T leaf, A leaf, is to, propose, to, to provide the anterior support of the vertebrae between the bodies. Yes. Uh, did you have any situations when the bone was migrated into the spinal canal after the surgery? Uh, really, uh, b before going out, I impact my bone very good uh, to avoid because in one case I got it, but it wasn't, uh, I, I got it uh, on the pictures, not uh, really with symptoms understand the patient uh, came for a decent level and I found that some chip uh, of the bone is still there. But uh, fortunately, if the bone is inside the, ch the canal, after a um, month or two months, begin absorption. Rarely it remains there. This is the, the migration of the cages is more than the migration of this bone. And to solve the problem of the correction, what I do always, I am doing uh, a longer screws, bicortical screws. The first cortex behind, and the, uh, the, I exceed the vertebra uh, five, uh, till five millimeters, and I, this, is, this make me a, a, a strong contrast that I can take uh, uh, behind the vertebra and elevate it, even in the osteoporotic patient. Thank you very much. Any uh, other questions? Try to avoid fuse. Hmm? Try to avoid fuse. It's more, it's more cheaper. Uh, you, if you don't diffuse, you will have a lot of people coming back because they have loosening of the screws and something like this. The fusion is the solution, not for, f for all of the people. You must select very good your patient because the adjacent uh, uh, disease. My problem with my patient in Palestine is that when they feel good, they go to, uh, to hard work. Most of the people are hard worker. If he's Officer, uh, in the uh, free time, he go to make uh, something the different uh, and the hard worker. Therefore, um, uh, I have a lot of uh, revisions because I am the only one who is doing a fusion till now in Palestine. And uh, therefore, I am uh, revising cases behind the others. And I think the fusion is good, is the best, uh, if it's good, yeah, if it's uh, with good correction of the alignment, sagittal balance, all of these things that we all know, I don't know and to bother you. Thank you very much, Dr. Talama. Okay, very good. You. Dear colleagues and friends, I think it is time to conclude our session and this meeting. I would like to thank you all for being so strong and staying until last minute, and I wish you a safe trip home. Thank you very much.